For about 30 years, I ping-ponged across the U.S. and Canada working with church leaderships. Uh, these took various forms, but the majority were entirely male, uh, held their meetings in closed rooms, and almost without exception, they were really, really good men. And they had, they had intentions to do the right thing for Jesus and their, their congregations, but they very often did not get the result they wanted. And that concerned them to the point where they wanted help. And so they would call me to come in, work with them sometimes a day, usually uh, two or three visits of a couple of days each. But they said, you know, what do we do to get better results, to, to get better buy-in from our congregation? Well, we're going to talk about that. Last week, we saw a gathering of the local church in Acts chapter 6 where a serious problem and it was a very serious problem, was presented to the apostles. And that was, if you weren't listening last week, uh, the Jews had always set aside money so that whenever there were people in need, particularly uh, widows and orphans, that that money was available for them. And uh, laying by in store, the Gentiles did not have such closed communities and did not have these plans. And yet when they came into the church... Now they saw that the Jewish widows were doing fine. The Gentile widows were desperate in need. And the Jewish people, uh, Christians, were, were saying, well, we saved this for years for our people. And now you just show up. And this is, this is not an easy problem to solve. No matter how much you love each other, this is not an easy thing to solve. So they come to the apostles and they say, what do we do? And the apostles said, you solve the problem, pick some people and fix it. In fact, they even refused to join in saying, we have a job. You're the ones who solve the problem, pick people and fix it. No direction on how, no direction on who. It's, it's, it's entirely unlike the leadership models you and I deal with in business corporations, in schools, and in churches. There are times that I've walked into these church leadership uh, meetings, and when I saw all their papers and their organization and such, there was, it would have been a very hard thing to tell the difference between their church leadership board and a Walmart board, or a um, Aldi, or any of, you, any of the things that are in your country. One of the first questions that I asked, and, and was asked frequently when we started our safe harbor. Uh, this whole network of churches that is worldwide and keeps growing. They said, "Would you have? Are you guys going to have elders? And how's that going to work? Elders in Tennessee that oversee people in, in Africa, Mexico, California? No, no. But before I go into why, let me bring up a couple of things." If you're from a church with an Episcopal organization, this will all be new to you. You've got a bishop, uh, you've got a cardinal, you've got somebody over a district. Most Protestant churches are Presbyterian in organization, not Presbyterian by name of denomination. By Presbyterian, it means they have presbyters, they have elders over a local congregation. That means that they pick people that they find among the congregation that are well-regarded, by the congregation and well regarded by the, um, the community. And this is if all things go well. And those people are then placed in leadership over that local congregation. They, you have other people involved. You have pastors and preachers and the like. But the ultimate deciders of what happens in that group and what won't happen in that group fall to these elders. I'm, instead of using presbyters and all the other names, I'm just going to say elders for now. But groups have, or others, people just call them board members. We do have a board here. But that board is to, uh, has two main jobs. The biggest job is to make sure that we are financially pure and right and moral. And that we're not you know, storing up riches for ourselves, but we are sharing charitable works uh, with you. Uh, as you saw with Taylor and Jill Hoskins, we have su supported that work. We've supported work in Northeast Missouri, and I could, I could go on, but the sermon, I was told how long I had today. So um, I think it was by very sleepy people <laughs> that hadn't had their coffee. Uh, and by the way, th that's kind of a joke. They give me a time 
slot, but then they say you don't have to land the plane then. But they're leaving, so I, I do need to, 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 to do the best. Why do we have this local top-down board type group? Well, we really got that idea from the Jewish community and from similar cultures. The Jews had community leaders who, by the way they lived their lives, had the respect of the community. There was no separation between church community and community community. Their community was all of it. And there was no separation between church community, the greater community, and their business community. To the Jews, it was all one. It was all put together. You didn't have one rules for how you behaved in a church house as opposed to how you behaved in business or how you behaved on the road or in any other situation because the community was watching. There was no privacy. There was no privacy at all. Most houses did not have interior walls unless you had some real good money. There was no privacy there. But also your windows were within you know, just a few feet of another person's dwelling and people walked here. People saw inside the houses there was no privacy. So it was a very different form of life. Everybody knew who the elders were. Although, and underline this in your head, there was no official ceremony to make him an elder. There was no announcement. They did not consider it an office. It was who you were. Everybody knew who they respected and who they didn't. And so everybody knew who the elders were. And so if they called a group saying, listen, we got a problem here. Let's bring the elders in on it. The elders If somebody gathered in that group that the community didn't care for, they would have removed the person because, very important, the elders in the Jewish communities did not go separate themselves from the others. The meetings were right out in the middle of everybody, and everybody had a say in and out of it. So if somebody who is not respectable and has mistreated people steps up and struts around like they're an elder, that's going to last about five seconds. The crowd's going to go, no. So it's very, very, very different from the church model which dominates Protestant churches and independent churches that claim they're not Protestant, Catholic, or Jew. And even those that say they're not a denomination, but they denominate themselves by the way that they conduct their worship or organize. Therefore, they got this leadership model too. In the early church, most Christians were Jews. And the tradition of listening to the local leaders who were well respected by all, continued until or unless there was a breaking point. We're going to see a breaking point today. There are those who believe that this is still the way it should continue, that we should have elders, but that we should formally, because we live in democracy land, um, that we should should formally vote for them, and then we should do all this other, and they make it an office, and next thing you know, you've got a Walmart board, but it claims to be a, a spiritual leadership board. And we all know. I've been, and I don't know that I can say thousands, but I've been close to a thousand of these over the last 30, 40 years. And most of the people in there know it's that way, and they don't want it to be that way, but churches force them to do it. Churches will go to them and say, you know, the members will go to them and say, instead of, I have a real problem understanding the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, can you help me? Or, my wife and I are really struggling with what to do with her parents or whatever. Instead of spiritual leadership, they they go and say, we really need some more decoration down that hallway. And you'd better do it because you're an elder. And they feel forced into that. We live in a whole different world. We cannot replicate the community that the Jewish people had. We just can't. We can have communities, and in fact, we do. Many of them are checking in. Many of them will check in later during the week. In fact, by far, most of our people watch this later. By the way, just a little segue, a little sidebar, rather. It's not a segue. Uh, every so often, I'll get an email from somebody that goes, we, re- we love you guys. We really, really, really love you guys. We're serious. We love you guys. And, and then they'll say, but we kind of needed a little bit more community, so we've been going to this church, but we're still watching you guys. Is that okay? Yes. To most people, we're an add-on, and that doesn't bother us a bit. You, uh, you find your community how you find your community. 
but we cannot replicate what the Jewish people had. Many of us have seen what happens when you take a blueprint from another time and try to impose it and overlay it on our day and age, and it's not good. Many of our church problems throughout history result from the leadership and who we chose. Even if you, let's say that you're, you know, Catholics don't get off here, take a look at some of the Catholics and how, uh, the, some of the priests, the bishops, the cardinals, popes, how they were chosen through history, and it's not a pretty one. There were some really great ones, but there were some just horrific individuals. Then it was done by, you know, there were bishops that were 12 years old because they were son of somebody powerful. And they couldn't even read, had no interest in church, but they were now a leader. So this is dirty no matter where you go, when you, whether it's Catholic or Protestant uh, or independent. The leadership model matters. There's, there are those who claim that the Bible is our roadmap and the Bible is our blueprint for the ages and it gives us a pattern for all things and a very popular book whenever I was a younger man that was shoved about through all, all of our, our church thing and you can still find it in church libraries, big old book called Behold the Pattern and it took um, about 60% more words than the Bible to prove that the Bible had a pattern for all things. I remember once speaking in a suburb of Houston at a church, and an elder approached me afterwards. He was, he was rather hot and indignant about something. He wasn't an elder at the church I was speaking at. And he said, uh, you know, I, you're, you're being unbiblical and you're being, you're being unscriptural about, and I said, I, I just put my hands up, said, wait, wait, hang on just a minute. And he wasn't expecting that, you know, a non-elder talking back, how, how, how? Anyway, I said, um, are you an elder? And he said, yes. I said, how'd you get to be one? And he looked at me and I said, I need to know where we're standing here. If I'm talking to an elder, uh, um, how'd you get to be one? And he says, well, the the congregation was asked to look among itself and then there was this vote and then there was, and I said, okay, don't ever, don't ever talk to me about unscriptural or anti-scriptural again, ever. And he said, why? And I said, there is one way in scripture, a person becomes an elder, and that's not it. And he looked, it broke my heart. He looked at me and he goes, well, what way is it? Had never read Titus? The only place in Titus is, Titus, by the way, was in a really rough place. Paul wasn't going to say, look around the community and find good people, because they just weren't. He said, Titus, you pick them. You pick them. So I said, did the minister choose you, call you, and then ordain you elder? And he said, no, no. And I said, it's the only way in scripture, it's scriptural. So you're not scriptural if it doesn't fit your concept of democracy, Western world, logic, board, leadership. Be aware of that. Uh, I don't know if that ever changed his mind or not. But sometimes you just need to approach people and say, you call for a pattern until you don't want it. But the pattern, is, is there a pattern? Is that what God wants? So, remember this. In Acts 6, the people didn't approach elders, but they approached the apostles. They, they kicked it up a notch, I guess. The 12 said no, moved it back to the people. Uh, the people solved it. Men and women would have solved it, because in Jewish communities, the women could also be involved in this. Um, And again, when I say that, I have to go with a wide brush. There are always little splinter groups that wouldn't, or that were predominantly women, or we're talking about the larger group here. If I have to do all of the exceptions, it's going to look like one of uh, Adam Nettesheim's grapevines. Uh, And I don't want that to happen, nor do I want Cammie to start, you know, snipping with snippers back there. Men and women were involved because you work it out in a community. You don't work it out in a closed room. You work it out in community. The elders can be there, even if you consider it an office and leadership, they can be there to make sure that the discussion flows in a Christian manner, but not to decide. That was not, in fact, we're going to show you the only elders meeting in the Bible. There's only one, well, in the New Testament. There's only one. And I've never heard a sermon about it in my life. You're going to see shortly why. 
uh, it, it's not one of, uh, it's, it would not have been one of our go-tos because it would have terrified us had we actually read it. By the way, and I have talked about men and women, we, uh, I'm contemplating doing a future series, and it might be a long one, on why I believe the Bible teaches men and women are equals in ministry and equals in all things. And so um, if, you, if the, that would interest you, let me know, because I'm right now wondering whether to do it in sermons or a special videos or a series of Mondays. So let me know. Um, you, you know our email. Uh, well, you can just write to me, patrick at oursafeharbor.com. The first and only elders meeting in the New Testament we find is in Acts chapter 15. And it is maybe not prescriptive. In other words, in other words, this doesn't have to be the pattern for elders meetings, but it is the only one we have. So it might be instructive to have a look. The question was about the universal question of the day. How Jewish do the Gentiles have to be to be Christians? Because all the Christians, or the great majority of Christians, were Gentiles. And then you, you get Cornelius, and you get some others in from the Gentiles. Then the Gentiles see what Jesus has to offer, and they want in. Well, the Jews had all these other traditions as well, and they had their laws from you know, the Deuteronomic laws, and plus their, um, their community, their holidays and the like. And circumcision, that was a big one. Uh, I always wonder, we fight so hard just to get people to be baptized. I'm really glad we don't have to fight that one too. You know, if somebody, we're baptized, somebody goes, I'm glad that's over. And we say, well, Harry, um, you know, <laughs> now that you mentioned it, um, I'd like for you to meet, you know, our, our rabbi off to the side. No, no, it, it was tough. And so, and, but some of the Jews, that, that was part and parcel of all of their religion. The Jews seem very happy to bring in the Gentiles at this stage in history. But how Jewish did the Gentiles need to be before they could be considered Christian? It was a very fair question. Very fair. The call for more rules and laws is a constant in the human condition. For every event, there are those who want to tax it, regulate it, prescribe it, control it. And as this is a universal temptation among human beings... We need to remember this and resist the temptation to regulate everything, to dominate anyone, or to rise and use power, even to rise and use power for what we think is right. It's a really, it's kind of like wearing white while running through a field of cattle. It's going to be hard to keep that thing unstained on the other end. Power is not, is, does not lead itself to moral purity. How the elders in Jerusalem handled this is amazing. They, they avoided every single pitfall that corporations, businesses, and churches fall into. They were confronted with conflict, disorder, disunity. So what happened? In Acts 15, all the disputing parties arrived at the mother church in Jerusalem. Already, every little bell in my uh, church as I was raised in is going... There, there are no, we're all independent. Well, they didn't think so. They decided to come home to the mother church in Jerusalem, and they didn't talk to the apostles, although some were there. They brought it to the elders of the Jerusalem community. Huh. Well, there's interesting. So, once the problem was, was, was put out, well, first of all, they listened. How about the first six verses? Certain people came from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Well, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers glad. Then when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Well, what did they start with? Let's gather as a community. There wasn't a, well, we'll take this up at the next elders meeting. Let's gather as a community, as many of us as we can get together. And then... Let's start by telling the good news about what God is doing in our lives. Think about that. 
If we had a room, and here come in the disputants, and they're you know, sitting on opposite sides, and we say, before we do anything, I'd like to know, Jim, Mary, but tell me about the good things you're seeing God do in your life and around you. And you spent your time there first. Do you think that might change the tone of the room? Or it might reveal some hearts that aren't ready for this discussion. Well, after that, they, that was great. And so Peter was the first to respond when some of the Pharisees group, and, and yes, there were Pharisees Christians, still are. You know, they may not know it, um, but the Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, that whole idea of the left, the right, super law, uh, super progressive, that's always been with us. And it was there in that community too. So the, the group that was hyper-conservative stood up and said, the Gentiles have to be circumcised to be saved. They're required to keep the law of Moses. That's verse 5. So Peter was the first to respond. Oh, he usually is, isn't he? Verse 7, after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel, and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we're saved, just as they are. Wow, well, he's not getting hired at a lot of churches. But what did he just say? The whole circumcision thing was a sign of purification. The whole law is about the washing, about what you wore, about what you eat, purification, purification. And Peter said, you know, it was that way, but you know that God accepted them as they were, gave them the Holy Spirit. He purified them. They didn't purify themselves. He's already purified them. They don't need more to do once God's accepted them. Wow. We just lost about two-thirds of the denominations out there that demand a Jesus and, Jesus and, and Jesus and. Then what'd they do? Another round of sharing the good news, verses 12 through 18 saying, you know, Paul and Barnabas got their chance of saying what God was doing among the Gentiles, and it was all good. It was amazing. After they did that, James, the leading elder, yes, there was an elder who was highly regarded more so than the other elders. He was a leading elder at the mother church. I'll, I'd offer to, to be quiet for a moment and let you get the vapors. Uh, away and let your heart settle but it's in the scripture and it's the only elders meeting we have official elders meeting we have in the New Testament so what happens he stood up to speak and what he had to say was amazing the lead elder of the mother church in Jerusalem the brother of Jesus says this it is my judgment therefore that we should not make it difficult for Gentiles who are turning to God Whoa, his first, his first instinct was, let's not make new laws. Let's not make this hard. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and the meat of strangled animals and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Most of us don't get what he just said, so let me help you. He's saying, don't act like pagans. The pagans do the blood stuff. They hang out at the blood temples and, uh, and the idol stuff. He said, just, just don't act like pagans. Don't be sexually immoral. But that last bit where he says, for the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times as read in the synagogue. He's saying, if you want to be more Jewish, it's easy to learn how to do that. So you can be more Jewish if you want to. You can do all the holidays. You can do the circumcision. You can do the food. That's fine. We don't, we don't do that in our communities because you can already learn that elsewhere. In our communities, we don't do that. We don't require that. 
because we are a new community. And then the elders and the apostles, it said, according, and it added, along with the whole church, that would include the women, wrote a letter to be sent out to all the churches, warning them not to listen to men who want to make rule after rule after rule. Going around on Facebook this morning, and I saw it on Twitter first, is a preacher saying we got to get rid of all of the bands, and we got to get rid of all of the drama, and we got to get rid of all of the acting on stage, and put the pulpit back, open up the Bible, and let it loose. Well, he wouldn't have liked this letter at all. He's probably a good guy, and what, he's, what he says, he probably believes with all of his heart. I've said worse things, and I believe them with all my heart. But take a look at what they wrote. Greetings. <laughs> Gary McDowell, who said he had Vietnam memories. Sorry. During that period, if you open up a letter that said greetings, that was bad news. It meant you were drafted. But not, this is good news. This is a good news letter. Greetings. We've heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we're sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we're writing. Listen carefully to this phrase. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You're to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You'll do well to avoid those things. Farewell. Boom. If they'd had mics, they would have thrown them, not dropped them. This is stunning. Did, did you notice that last phrase? You will do well to avoid these things. They didn't even say, but if you mess up and you're doing this stuff, you're lost. No. They have Jesus. If they mess up, they have Jesus. They're just saying, try not to do that. What a mind-blowing letter. And it's the only example we have on how to lead a church. And so some of you that have written in and saying, well, what is your stance on and what is your stance on? Here's our stance. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the promised Messiah the Savior of the world, and He is our Lord of Lords and King of Kings. That's where we stand. Amen. Everything else, you would do well to avoid some things, but I will not make a rule because I have no authority to do that. If these people, the brother of Jesus Christ, who is the leading elder at a church in the mother church in Jerusalem, who was the official spokesman, not even the apostles, Refuse to make rules for other people. How dare I do that? So I will not. The scripture says that the people who received it, you heard Libby read that from New Jersey, that there was great joy. Well, of course there's great joy because they've kept the focus on Jesus. They're not looking for uniformity. They're not looking for conformity. Focus on Jesus because no other foundation has been laid that can be laid than that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I have stood a couple of times on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, Scotland, the capital of Scotland. If you've not been, you need to, need to go. The Royal Mile connects uh, the castle at the high point to Holyrood Palace, at, and rude doesn't mean rude, it, it's an old Scottish word for cross. So Holy Cross Palace at the, at the bottom. All overseen by amazing medieval and ancient buildings and uh, Arthur's Seat, which is a great volcanic arch that goes up. And I've stood on that and watched as the doors of St. Giles Cathedral, the mother church of Presbyterianism worldwide, would open and the elders of the Kirk would come out in their black robes and they would do their pronouncements. Now, they, they used to stand and read things, but that's, you know, it's trafficked now, and you've got public and all that. And so they will publish them. And the paper normally covers the papers. There's so many newspapers. The papers will normally cover the, you know, we've made a stand on this, and this is what we're going to do about this. 
And we've seen this in other churches, have we not? Whenever, let's say, United Methodists come out and they'll say, well, this is where we're going to stand on who can be married by whom and where, where the Episcopalians and the Anglicans will, will go at each other over some of the same issues. We've seen this. I've witnessed the same things also happen in local churches. Whenever the elders will step out on a Sunday morning and say, they'll send one up, one sacrificial lamb up to read the letter. And, you know, we're, this is where, we're, where you stand on this, and this is who can be a member here, and this is what we'll tolerate. And this is, you've all seen it. We've, we've seen this. And yet nothing like that is found in Scripture. Not one single time. As I said a lot more kindly than it's going to sound to that elder I talked about down outside of Houston. I said, I know you love your book, but you're not reading it. You need to know it. Not just the passages you like, not just your proof text, not just the go-to places. You need the, the whole gestalt. I could use that because I knew his background. He knew what the word, it just means all of it, a very holistic, you got to know the ins and outs and what's not there too. In the churches of my youth, I was raised in the churches of Christ and they are related to the independent Christian churches and now kind of distant cousins to the disciples of Christ. But they had a leader in the uh, 1800s, David Lipscomb. Uh, there's a great university and it is a great university, very, very close to the soundstage that's named after him. Uh, and no reason it shouldn't be. He was a great individual. And he was a very, very conservative individual. Very much so. He and I would not agree upon everything, but we'd agree upon a lot. And you know one of the things he wrote about extensively? He did not believe that being an elder was an office or a rank in the church and was highly opposed to anybody doing a ceremony to make somebody an elder and for them then to go off and have a meeting he believed that that was completely wrong. It reeked of Rome. It did not, that's his phrase. Not, it did not reek of scripture. And he agrees with me and a lot of others who say it's a description of a kind of a person. It's not a rank. It's not an office. We here at Our Safe Harbor follow Acts 6 and 15. I am so dedicated to this that a church that I served once was being sued uh, the church was in the right. And I won't go into any details because that's not the point. Well, during the suit drug, drug on for years. And at one point, we were all subpoenaed. Um, I didn't see paper. It just, I don't know how they do it now. But we had to turn over all of our emails and communications that we've ever said anything about a piece of property and all of this lawsuit or we've ever mentioned the, the person bringing the lawsuit. We all had to do that. It was a forensic audit. And when I heard from the lawyer's office, I called back and I said, I won't be sending you anything. And they said, we need to see all of your emails to see if you... And I said, I want to read to you something. And I read to them parts of Acts 6. I said, I'm an Acts 6 guy. There's no email where I've talked about this. None. I refuse to be copied on any of it. Because I'm a pastor. I'm a leader of a church and that needs to stay focused and humble and teachable. And therefore, I've got one job. And I don't do those other jobs. I have no part of it. And by the way, after about two calls, the lawyer went, okay. Which I thought was pretty cool. But I'm an Act 6 guy. I'm not going to mess with the other little stuff. This is our job. You need to kind of look at these again and think, what am I insisting on that I, need, I can pull back and not have a Jesus and church? We don't have people who go into closed rooms and come out with pronouncements. Now, we do have a board here. And I think I only brought up one of the jobs. One of the, jo the main job is to keep us financially pure, plain, you know, honorable, moral, where everybody would, would like what we're doing. Uh, every Christian would like what we're doing. The, the other second job is to serve as my friends, to advise and consent, because I don't know everything, and I might say, hey, I have this idea. You know, and Dave and Jean Ann or Mary Alice might say, ooh, very interesting. Let's talk about that never. You know, and, and 
Or they might say they have an idea, and, but it's people to bounce off of. And anytime we have a meeting, yeah, the doors are closed because we have four seasons in Tennessee and we go from air conditioner to heater uh, and back again, sometimes in the same week. But anybody who wants to come in that meeting can. Anybody can. There's nothing secret there. We don't do that. It's a community thing. And here's another way that you participate. Who are the elders here? All of you. You write in. You, you email, you text, you call, you have ideas, you tell us about works like um, Taylor and Jill told us about in Arizona. We just found out about one in Spokane, by the way, um, that the Burrises are involved with. We, uh, the, the Mandorfers, Lib- Libby and Mandy have been reading scripture for us. And you know Maggie takes care of homeless vets in New Jersey. They reach out and they say, I think we should be doing this. And we're going, we agree. So what are we doing we are accepting all the elders, male and female, in our community, and that includes you. You're part of this decision-making group. No closed doors. We're not a top-down church. We are pastor-driven in the sense that you see my face and I got the ideas and such, but I'm not in charge alone here. We got you here, too. We are one in that we have the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's enough. That's enough. That's the high road that we think we should take. 